It's my pleasure now to introduce our next speaker, Dr. Carla Nestor. She is the director of the Pediatric Glomerular Disease Clinic and associate professor of pediatrics, nephrology, dialysis, and transplantation. And from my understanding, was recently appointed chief of this uh, section. Uh, congratulations for that. She's also an ass associate professor of internal medicine at the University of Iowa Healthcare and has had a longstanding interest in atypical HUS. And today she'll be talking about the syndrome of HUS in childbearing um, age women. Thank you so much, Dr. Nestor. As uh, was already uh, given to you, I'm going to be talking about hemolytic uremic syndrome in, in childbearing age women. It probably won't surprise you. Well, it, I, I work in a complement lab, so all of the diseases I work with are complement-mediated kidney diseases, so it probably doesn't surprise you that I also have a fairly heavy anti-complement drug disclosure list that I need to give to you. In fact, uh, uh, it's an, an exciting time for us in this field because as we think about uh, all of the anti-complement drugs that are coming, and they're coming to different areas in the APC, so uh, we're very excited to be participating in, in a number of these clinical trials. So my objectives, I would like to review the diagnostic approach to HUS in pregnancy. I would like to uh, have you recognize the role of complement in pregnancy-associated HUS, review the outcomes of HUS uh, in pregnancy, and finally to, to uh, really just scratch the surface of management of the approach uh, for HUS in pregnancy. And this is primarily, the only reason we can scratch the surface, if you will, is because there are no clinical trials. That part probably doesn't surprise you, but uh, there are a number of approaches you could take, and so we'll just discuss one or two of them. So what I want to start with, actually, is, is this slide. And, and you've already heard this in a bit of the discussion is the problem with the whole discussion around atypical H's is already uh, what has been alluded to. And in fact, if you look at these, um, if these different infections and, and organisms or even diseases, we, we've coined this the TMA peacock. Unfortunately, as has already been discussed, is, you know, is this help? Is this complement-mediated disease? The same discuss discussion can be had in a number of other areas. For instance, uh, is this parasite actually causing the TMA, or is the parasite causing a complement-mediated disease? Is the vaccination causing the problem? Is the cancer causing the problem? Is genocide being the problem, et cetera? There are very many associations that have been published that say, that there are many things that cause TMA. We are not very good about figuring out how many of these actually are complement-mediated TMAs, and it is definitely an area for research in the future. But importantly, it definitely influences the cohorts that you look at and how they've chosen the cohort and how they may have accidentally let one of these other diseases slip in there and whether that actually helps you with understanding what the outcomes are. So this is just my sort of uh, pre-slide to indicate to you that a lot of what we talk about, you have to make some assumptions. You have to make the assumption that we've made the diagnosis correct. So what, let me go very briefly into the epidemiology of the presentation in non-pregnant women, and then I'm going to go hopefully very quickly into the pregnant women group. So it affects both uh, children's and, and adults. The age range actually is one month to 85 years, and we're talking about just straight up atypical HUS. The male to female ratio is very similar in children, but I thought that it might be of interest to you that actually there is a female predominance in, the adu in adulthood. At least that's what our current cohorts would tell us. Triggering events are documented in at least 70% of patients. When there is a triggering event, it, it can often be diarrhea. That used to be our distinction that we were dealing with typical HUS, and in fact, it's not. Of course, bloody diarrhea is very likely to be typical, but a lot of atypical HUS patients can have uh, diarrhea. There is also um, a triggering event may also be respiratory illness like a URI, and certainly as has already been indicated, pregnancy can be a, a triggering event. Approximately 15% of patients in the current cohorts will actually have a normal platelet count, and, and that's in part probably because the platelet count range is fairly large, 150 to 350 perhaps. Maybe a platelet count is 154 when in fact it should be 254 or something like that, but it is worth noting that you can't exclude atypical HUS from your differential simply based on a normal platelet count. Standard diagnosis still remains, however, the microangiopathic hemolytic anemia with thrombocytopenia 
Again, it may be relative thrombocytopenia associated with renal failure. That is still the standard way to diagnose atypical HUS, and certainly, as you've already heard, can have lots of overlapping features with other diseases. Finally, you cannot use complement laboratory values to tell you whether this is atypical HUS. That is something that's been put forward multiple times. But in fact, for instance, the most likely complement value you can get in your clinical setting is C3. And C3 is not always low in this group of patients. And in fact, it turns out that it's probably mutation related as to which ones will actually have a low C3. So again, that cannot be part of your screening process in deciding whether something, someone is help, for instance, versus uh, um, atypical HUS. Extra renal events occur in up to 20% of patients. Very often or most often, it's going to be neurologic. So again, you can see some overlap with TTP if you have a patient who has significant neurologic abnormality and they're presenting to you with a thrombotic microangiopathy. Cardiac events can be uh, in up to 10%, and in fact, it can occur in pediatric patients also. Historically, the majority of children, so up to 81% of children and adults up to 59% actually have required dialysis at presentation, and those numbers are, are actually even higher if you move a little bit further in some of the newer cohorts. So there's a lot of renal needs in this group of patients. The five-year risk for end-stage renal disease, it tends to be related, at least in the cohorts that have been published, related to the, the gene mutation. And I brought this forward. Again, this is based on only uh, one particular um, uh, publication, but the end-stage renal disease risk is much higher if you have a complement factor H mutation than, say, for instance, if you have a um, C3 mutation or if a CFHR5 mutation. And similarly, uh, historically, again, pre-eculizumab or pre-terminal complement blockade, the risk of recurrence in transplant is extremely high. So you can see we're still on the leading edge, if you will, of trying to understand exactly what our outcomes are going to be in this, uh, this, uh, this disease because we're still trying to understand exactly what the role of complement gene, ver the various complement genes are, and then, of course, how uh, terminal complement blockade may have changed the picture. So this is the only complement picture I'm going to give you, and I'm going to give it to you. Uh, it's, the, it's the skinny down version or the Reader's Digest version. And, and the reason I'm giving it to you this way is because I gave you that list of, um, I gave you that list of uh, gene abnormalities that are playing a role in atypical HUS. What I want to do right now is actually just share with you where they are. For instance, can you, I don't know if you can see the factor H there, but the factor H is, uh, accounts for about 24 to 27% in the more current cohorts uh, for the abnormalities in atypical HUS patients. 2 to 8% of patients with atypical HUS will have a C3 abnormality. 4 to 8% will have a complement factor I abnormality. 5 to 9% will have an MCP abnormality. 3% may have actually more than one abnormality. And, and again, the, a part of the reason I present this to you broken down like this is because we have moved past the stage where we only have terminal complement blockade. Now, of course, it's, they're not being trialed in the atypical. Many of these drugs are not being trialed in atypical HUS. But I think as a forward-thinking group, we should be thinking about, for instance, if you have a factor B abnormality, uh, that perhaps your drug of choice should be an anti-B drug, and that is the direction that the field will eventually move, I suspect. Just for a, a little bit of extra detail, both the C3 and factor B mutations t tend to be gain-of-function mutations, where the others uh, tend to be loss-of-function. Finally, you probably do know about the factor H autoantibody, and that accounts for, at least in the adult world, probably about 3 to 6 percent of, of atypical H. It's, it's probably higher, closer to 10 percent in children. But even um, last but not least is this idea that the complement factor H-related proteins often play a role, or often is, is an overstatement, obviously, in an ultra-rare disease, but, but they certainly do account for some of the cases of atypical HUS, and they can, in fact, be incredibly important. And the reason they're actually, this is, I know, a very busy slide, but I wanted to just show you that you can have complement factor H that is fused with complement factor H-related 1, or you can have factor H related, uh, fused to complement factor H-related 3, et cetera. The point of this slide is, is that just by doing a uh, next generation sequencing or Sanger sequencing, you're not going to be able to pick this group of patients up. So please keep in mind that you can't just stop it at, at NGS and expect to get everything that you need uh, for this patient group. 
So that's how it looks when you separate those complement factors out across the, a, the alternate pathway or, or uh, the APC has been referred to. So you can see that there is uh, uh, definitely a number of, of genes that are involved. That's in the, by the way, again, that's in the, the straight up uh, atypical HUS, not necessarily in the pregnancy associated group. So how is management to, uh, to go for us? Historically, you probably know this, uh, plasma exchange, corticosteroids, even IVIG, even some patients have uh, gone through uh, with no treatment and that's actually been uh, what we have seen historically. And in fact, uh, plasma exchange is still very important for a number of places because we are still worried about a presentation often, whether it's TTP, so you will often see patients be started on plasma exchange, but also there are places in the world that do not have uh, access to uh, terminal complement blockade, so plasma exchange must re remain part of our treatment. But I wanted to present to you this uh, in the fact that uh, you can see, uh, and pay attention to, the, to the, the far right column, if you will. And so if you have a factor H mutation uh, in that particular study, only 63% of them actually responded to plasma exchange. If you have a factor I, 25% respond, et cetera, et cetera. The point I'm getting at is, is that uh, because we are still using retrospective data to determine whether we are actually going to have uh, an effective treatment plan by using plasma exchange, we're still a bit in the dark when we use that therapy in this setting. So what instead is, uh, tends to be the more updated approach, it is expert opinion based. It does have at least some basic trial data, the trial data that was used to actually get terminal complement blockade uh, an indication. But it is uh, felt that uh, eculizumab does make a reasonable uh, approach to patients with atypical HUS. So in fact, uh, you, will, you will find that the, one of the first things we do is, and, and you all know this as hematologists, we have to rule out TTP. We have to uh, begin eculizumab as a nephrologist, I am clear in my head that the earliest we start with eculizumab, the better the patient is suited. And I'm going to provide you with some very basic data based on those two trials that were published in the New England Journal of Medicine. Length of therapy is still very unclear. Uh, of course, it's being suggested from the very beginning that it's lifelong. I think we all believe that it's not lifelong for, for many, many patients, but it's still an undone issue as to whether that's going to be the case. And of course, as we're going to talk about pregnancy now, we have to talk about whether eculizumab actually will affect the children. So how effective is eculizumab? Well, I'll, I'm just going to give you very quickly that New England Journal of Medicine where uh, basically trial one, trial two, we had 17 patients who were started early, 20 patients who were started a little bit later. And what you can see is, is they got complete TMA response in 65% of them if you were in that trial one, so early start, only 25% TMA response if you were in trial two, a little bit later start. That's why as a nephrologist, I choose early if I am given that opportunity. And then in fact, disease and a decrease in the serum creatinine was actually uh, seen an improvement in 65%, 65% uh, of patients had a decrease in that creatinine if they were in the trial one, as opposed to 15% in the, in the trial two. So again, uh, we, we, in the nephrology world, we often say time is kidney. I mean, that's a phrase that's often used that, that, that we would prefer whatever your anti-complement approach is, uh, whether it is plasma exchange or eculizumab, we prefer that it's done early, please. So now let's take it a little bit forward to a real world cohort. And now we have, a, uh, and this is actually just uh, published, you can see it published in 2018. I just wanted to share with you that we essentially have very similar responses in the real world setting. Now these are not controlled trials. That other was an actual trial. Uh, this one is now though telling you that of 29 patients without the ability to control when or how they got their eculizumab, we also still have a TMA event-free status of on 60 68% of those patients with terminal complement blockade, uh, normalization of platelets of 57%, and again, a decrease in creatinine of 57%. So again, it would suggest that even in the real world, you actually can consider terminal complement blockade to treat these patients. How about in the French group? It's very similar in terms of 30, a few more patients, 38 patients this time. Uh, this time, again, also the time that they actually started uh, eculizumab and time on eculizumab, for instance, how many doses also not uh, controlled for. So again, you, you can see that there's going to be considerable variable, variability in the outcomes here. But I just want to provide for you the two other parameters that I've been giving you earlier, complete TMA response in 56%, improvement in GFR in 54%. So again, uh, you're, you're still uh, getting a little bit over the 50% to 
consider whether eculizumab is reasonable. These are very important when you think about treating a pregnant woman because you need to feel that you're going to have some success before you put either her or the infant uh, at risk of being exposed to a medication that perhaps is not ideal. So I don't have a TMA peacock for the pregnancy group, so all what I have, and I've decided perhaps I should flip it upside down and make it a pheasant or something, I'm not sure, but um, you can see that I, what I've tried to do is list the three major things in pregnancy that are, that are going to be confused. And if you notice the left hand or the picture that's there, that's an actual thrombotic microangiopathy from the kidney picture. That is my uh, shorthand to tell you that at the end of the day, it's nearly impossible to tell the difference between these three uh, disease entities in any given patient. Of course, I've highlighted in black or bold, if you will, uh, the areas that I think help. For instance, in, in help, no pun intended, in HELP syndrome, uh, we think, of course, obviously the liver enzymes are going to be the abnormal ones, but I have definitely had factor H abnormality patients who have actually had liver involvement. Uh, thrombotic, or, or TTP, of course, as you know, if you can get very quick uh, ADAMS TS13 levels or inhibitors, that's going to help you take that one off of your, your, your list of uh, diagnoses fairly quickly. But at the end of the day, uh, for complement-mediated TMA, you're still essentially left with either this is a recurrent episode for this patient, or you've ruled everything else out and you're scared it could be atypical HUS, so you move ahead uh, with that in mind. And that's how I approach it with our OBGYN uh, group is, as I say, if you've really done the best you can do to rule things out and you really can't be sure what is going to be coming next, I think it makes perfect sense to leave atypical HUS on the top of your list or at least close to the top of your list so that you do respond appropriately. And if data comes from our, from our previous speaker that it turns out that HELP does have complement mediate, complement, uh, you know, a significant complement mediated uh, component, then of course these, these issues of trying to split these hairs will be a little less important, at least in the acute setting. So the role of complement uh, abnormality in atypical HUS, it's believed, I showed you that uh, complement diagram, it's believed that it, it really does have a lot of complement abnormality in it. But as you can see uh, from that bottom graph, uh, or that bottom triangle, if you will, I think we're going to see these things start squishing together a little bit, where, or help is going to move a little bit more, I guess, to your right. Uh, and it's going to be that, that, in fact, we are going to find more complement involved. Right now, you don't have that luxury, so you're still stuck trying to, uh, at least clinically and availability of the drug, still tr stuck trying to decide whether your patient has atypical HUS or not. So now I gave you the epidemiology of it in uh, native kidney disease, not in the pregnancy setting. So let's talk about it during the pregnancy setting. And you have seen some of these numbers already. So it's likely to occur in 1 in 25,000 pregnancies. The mean age is 28, the range 23 to 41. 62% uh, present outside of the first pregnancy. That was what was discussed by one of your, qu your questions earlier. 79% present, present postpartum. And I'm going to give you uh, a, a screenshot of two very nice figures that were presented in two of the more current cohorts that, that sort of help, I think, visually make this, this case. The earliest is at four weeks gestation, and the latest was at five weeks postpartum and accounts for about 21% of women with atypical HUS. So a lot of women with, a women with atypical HUS, pregnancy has actually been very integral to making them have an episode. This is what I wanted to show you. And, and so on the top, and it, it doesn't show perfectly, the top diamonds are actually in green. That is what these investigators believed were TTP patients. So these are women who they felt classified well as TTP, as opposed, as opposed to the blue um, triangles below. That group is the group that they labeled as atypical HUS. And you can see quite nicely that if your patient presents to the emergency room three weeks after delivery with a TMA, Maha with thrombocytopenia and renal failure, I am absolutely going to be putting atypical HUS at the top of my list of possibilities. And in fact, that patient did exactly happen to me. And, and when we did her genetic investigation, she had a very large deletion in her complement factor H gene. She just, she was 20 something when she, with this pregnancy, she just didn't happen to manifest atypical HUS until after the pregnancy. Similarly, there was another set of authors, and again, you can see these, those in the, in the references, but uh, this is the same story in this most recent 2018 publication. In fact, most atypical HUS patients do present postpartum. Again, 
This makes it look easy. I recognize it's it nearly impossible when these patients, because could this be preeclampsia, et cetera, et cetera. There's a lot of things that still could be going on. 81% of, uh, of women who have pregnancy-associated atypical HUS require dialysis. Up to 76% of them will actually still require dialysis uh, at follow-up and, and, in fact, will be at end stage. That woman who presented at three weeks that I just mentioned to you, she never recovered. She went end stage, and we were not able. She did get exposed to eculizumab, but, in fact, by the time she came in three weeks after her pregnancy, the kidney was already gone for her, so we were not able to salvage that. 90% will have some type of complement abnormality, and I'm going to give you those, uh, those numbers across a couple of cohorts, and the highest risk is during the second pregnancy, and at least that's what has been reported. And just so that we can talk very uh, a little bit about uh, fetal, the effect on the fetus, uh, in this particular cohort, 4.8% had fetal loss and 7.7% had uh, preeclampsia. So again, atypical HUS is very important both to mother and to baby. What I tried to do, and I recognize these are busy slides, these next two look like this, but what I tried to do is give you all three of the largest cohorts here so that you could see them. One is 21 patients from the French group, 22 patients from the Spanish group, and then another 14 from the group in Vienna. And in fact, what I wanted you to see basically is, is that, they, that uh, in general in the Spanish and Vienna cohort, they did present in the first pregnancy. In that original French group, it was not postpartum. The majority are pre presenting postpartum, so even though this isn't trial data, now you've got three reasonable sized cohorts in an ultra rare disease to say that postpartum is, is a really high risk time frame that we should be watching for. And then I'll, I'll just skip down and say that the complement abnormalities were very significant in this group. So in the French group, up to 90% of them had complement abnormalities, Spanish group 41%, and then in the Vienna group, 71% uh, of these patients actually had complement abnormality. That makes you feel great that you got the right diagnosis, but as we've talked about before in these forums, you are not going to have availability of the genetics at the moment that you need to be making your decision whether you're dealing with atypical HUS or not. And then just a little bit more of follow-up, again, trying to read across these various cohorts. Again, in the French study, 81% at presentation uh, needed dialysis. The Spanish group helps us just a little bit figure out about whether eculizumab or, or terminal complement blockade is doing us any good because they, in fact, had 10 who had been exposed to terminal complement blockade and 12 that hadn't. And you can see that there appears to be possibly a trend uh, towards in improvement or getting a little bit away from end-stage renal disease by having been exposed to eculizumab. Again, this is not controlled, so it's not something you can bank on, but you might be able to learn just a little bit from. Similarly, though, I will point out that in the Vienna group that the majority of their patients actually were exposed to plasma exchange, and you can see that if you did get plasma exchange, your risk for CKD 4 or 5, so late kidney disease, was 38 percent, as opposed to if you did not get plasma exchange, there was a, higher, a slightly higher risk at 50 percent. So you can see that uh, even in those uh, areas where, where uh, terminal complement blockade is not available, that plasma exchange is going to potentially help this group of patients. And then again, I, I uh, added one more fetal loss and preeclampsia, a uh, couple of stats for you. We already talked about the 4.8 and the 7.7. In the Vienna group, they actually had 11% uh, fetal loss, but again, it was in a fairly small number of patients. So what is the role of complement? The complement abnormality identified in pregnant women, so it turns out that you have about 45% of them will have a factor H abnormality, 9% will have an I abnormality, 9% a C3 abnormality. Again, if you remember that picture I gave you, so these are just areas along the alternate pathway, uh, and 4% have an MCP abnormality. So you might ask yourself why, again, uh, I thought I was going to have to answer this for you, but it turns out that your two speakers ago helped me with that considerably. Why would factor H be such a problem, and could you have guessed that it's postpartum? And in fact, if the placenta carries a lot of factor H and it is a complement uh, regulator and you suddenly lose the placenta, then in fact you've lost complement regulation. It, that's a little bit of hand waving, yet it's not proven fully, but there are lots of there are lots of pieces of evidence to say that that interaction between the placenta and the mother uh, is very important for why this this uh, disease may uh, occur postpartum. 
So how do we manage pregnancy-associated HUS? Well, it's very fair to tell you there are zero clinical trials in plasma therapy, so we don't know. Uh, in the Vienna group, the, the majority of those women were handled with plasma exchange or plasma therapy of some kind, whether it was exchange or infusion. Uh, and there were some decent outcomes there, but there are no clinical trials to tell us if we could have done better. Clinical trials for terminal complement blockade are in the non-pregnant uh, group, so we're relying on those that are actually derived from, um, you know, standard uh, atypical HUS, so that New England Journal of Medicine trial one and trial two, and lots of retrospective looks to see, for instance, the Spanish group, they gave us a retrospective look about what would happen in, in terms of your risk for end-stage renal disease if you were exposed to eculizumab during your pregnancy-associated atypical HUS. Importantly, uh, both of these interventions are going to be used, plasma exchange or eculizumab, but there still needs to be a bit more uh, information available on the safety of plasma exchange to the fetus. At least we have a little bit more experience with that, but then also of uh, safety with eculizumab. And in fact, we can rely a bit on the PNH literature to help us and a bit on the fact that it turns out that probably uh, this, this antibody does not cross easily across the placental barrier. There was one study that said two of 22 uh, uh, cord blood specimens were found to have eculizumab in them. So you can see that um, uh, you're going to basically treat these women as you would a standard atypical HUS patient. The huge problem, of course, is, is making the diagnosis quickly, eliminating those other diseases as quick as you can so that you can actually um, move on to the appropriate treatment, whatever that appropriate treatment tends to be in your center. I've collected about four or five future directions because I think that, you know, I, I started my discussion by saying that the problem even talking about atypical HUS as the first question, uh, the gentleman that came up, um, we're having these discussions all the time. They happen all the time in my center between the hematologist, mostly between the, uh, the nephrologist and the obstetric, obstetric doctor, but, but the hematologists are often involved in our center too. But the point is, is that we do need a better way to diagnose these diseases so that we can actually plan the proper treatment. We do need better mouse models, probably, of understanding exactly which of these diseases uh, have uh, critical primary complement uh, abnormalities. Or we just need to accept the fact that even if we can't say that they're primary complement abnormality, there is enough secondary complement abnormality to trigger uh, some sort of complement approach would be great if we could have a clinical trial. I'll take even what our previous speaker is planning. Uh, if we can at least get uh, something like that, that would be great because then we could figure out whether um, we know it works in atypical HUS based on trial data. If we could now also know it worked in help, then, then we could just say, okay, we'll figure it out later. And then, of course, we need further safety monitoring. I will very quickly say that uh, I'm very thankful to have two families in my group. I have my science family, which is our genetic and complement lab, which is that that you see on the right there. But then I also have an absolutely fantastic uh, nephrology group that I work in that uh, are very thoughtful, very uh, giving um, people. So, thank you, yeah, Carla. Thank you for uh, bringing up the same point I discussed earlier. I mean, I'm Dr. Yakub, University of Kansas. I'm a hematologist. Um, and I, um, again, I have a lot involved into this, and then you have a pregnancy clinic, so it's kind of uh, my overlap in this topic. Um, so um, I just kind of want to caution about the retrospective reporting. So the question number one on your, uh, your survey and the, and the slide you had about the incidence of atypical HUS being postpartum. Um, so again, a, a lot of the, the processes happen is that patients have an issue, they assume it's health, they deliver them, they don't get better, so by exclusion. It's a typical HUS. So you end up with a big clustering of reporting of atypical HUS postpartum, but that's not true it's by, because you've excluded the other conditions or you have ruled out health. So you're thinking it's just late diagnosis at that point? No, I think it's once you've ruled out health by delivery, then the only thing left would have been a typical HUS. Oh, I see. So you end up with this big cluster of postpartum reporting but again, if you go back and really analyze when the processes of how this happened, it's flawed by design because the only way to rule out help is by delivering. So if you're postpartum and you don't have, you know, you've ruled out help, then you call it atypical HUS. So you get this spike of reporting postpartum, 
that is very artificial. It, it is a very good uh, comment, yeah. and I can't speak to that with res respect to the Vienna study or the Spanish study. I would need to dig into that. But for instance, the French study, they actually excluded in their atypical HUS diagnosis any liver function abnormalities. So they, that group would not have even qualified for the atypical HUS diagnosis, or for the help diagnosis, if you will. So you have an incomplete help, and you assume it is, yes. and you deliver the patient, and don't get better, and a week later, two weeks later, three weeks later, then you call it a typical HUS. That's really the usual course. So you end up with this big cluster of reporting postpartum, but they probably the process went, has been happening a lot longer. It just got way too clinically evident, and you roll out TTP because you got your Adams 13, Adams 13 back, and you roll out help because you delivered, and by exclusion, you got an atypical HUS. But that's a little bit way too far, too late. Uh, and then uh, statistically, you're biased because you're showing those numbers to be postpartum. Right. So, so the significance of what you're saying, though, is, is then, the, then that would mean that a consideration for atypical HUS much earlier on in the, or pre-delivery should be considered, number one. And, but then we come back to the issue which you've brought, brought up earlier. What is going to be your distinguishing lab test or your distinguishing characteristic of the patient to tell you that, no, this is complement-mediated disease or this is atypical HUS, it's not help? I'm not going to treat this yeah. patient as standard help. Yeah, that, yeah, that's going to be the same question. But to answer the, the, the no, question number one in the patient survey, that I disagree with the answer because, you know, again, the answer is based on that fact. And that means we have to think of a typical HUS of the disease that happened postpartum. Yes, if, if they happen postpartum, they have to be a typical HUS. But that shouldn't mean that we're not thinking of them prepartum, too. Right. No, I agree with you. It should be thought across the entire time. I, w I do wish we had a way to distinguish. Thank you. Thank you mm -hmm. for that question. Yeah. We're going to take one last question. Okay. Uh, so, and, but, we have, but before we do, I want to announce that we have blown through our break time. And I recognize that some of you may need to take a break. And if you do, please don't feel rude if you have to excuse yourself. But we're going to keep moving with the program. Last so, um, how long does it take you uh, to can get? Can you say who you are? And I'm Sam going? Sam Berkman, Los Angeles. How long does it um, take you to get a factor H level back? And I know you have to give plasma exchange because at presentation you're not sure whether it's TTP or atypical HUS. But do you really think that plasma exchange does anything to prevent the renal disease? <laughs> well, I am a nephrologist, so I would say that um, I have not been impressed with the plasma exchange uh, response than for the kidney, if you will. And if you think about it scientifically, for instance, factor H, if you truly do have a factor H abnormality, you could literally just give factor H back to the patient potentially and you could help them. There would be no, no way for me to say that terminal complement blockade would be better than anything in that circumstance. The problem is, is as you say, it, it, well, in my lab, because we do them, we can get them back within, you know, 48 hours. Really? But across, <laughs> across the world, I think it's quite a bit different, obviously. So, so the point would be is, is that I can't just use plasma infusion or plasma exchange thinking that it could be factor H because it could be, you know, C3 or MCP or something else. So that's the disadvantage in my mind of using plasma is it may not be, you can't deliver enough plasma to re-regulate a system that's not working unless you know what you're working with. And so that would be my scientific reason for why plasma might not work for the kidney. And again, the kidney is ischemic in this process. So imagine you being without oxygen for a couple of days how you would be feeling, and, and that's, that's sort of how I look about the kidney. It's ischemic throughout this entire process, so the longer it takes to actually stop the process, the more likely there's dead tissue distal to that. So you get it back in 48 hours. <laughs> that's amazing. <laughs> I work in a complement lab, though, that we can get those things. <laughs>